Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank Thee this evening hour for this house where we are met tonight to worship Thee in spirit and in truth, to listen to Thy word read, and to declare the truth and contend for the faith. We pray that tonight Thou wouldst bless Thy holy word to our hearts. We thank Thee that the entrance of Thy Word giveth light. And we pray that tonight man and woman may get light from Thy precious Word. We live in a day of darkness, a day of deception, a day of deceit, a day of shallowness among the people of God, a day of light religion, a day of frivolity in God's heart. O oh God, we pray that tonight, as we listen to thy truth, that thy truth shall set us free, and we will know that freedom and emancipation that is of the law. We pray tonight to give us understanding of the times, that we'll know what Israel has to do in this evil day. And we pray that we'll stand true and faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ and to His truth. We pray, our God and Father, that Thou wouldst take our thanks for Thy blessing upon us this day, for Thy presence this morning in the prison service, for Thy presence in this house as we minister the Word, for Thy rich presence in Palomina. Thank Thee for many people here in the meeting tonight. And they were in Bellamina this afternoon and got gloriously saved by God's grace. And this is their first service in God's house as a believer. And your fond joy of God is upon them. We pray for that dear woman from Dungannon and her daughter who came to Christ this afternoon. We thank the our God and Father for those that came last Sunday night. There's a breath of revival amongst us. There's the sun of abundance of rain. But, O oh God, we pray that Thou wouldst release Thy power this evening and grant that many, many may be the slain of the Lord. Remember this island home of ours. Remember this province that we love, land of our fathers. Give us not over as a prey to our enemies. Send to this land a great revival of true religion. And grant, O God, that we will see in this day a great and a wonderful deliverance. Smite popery. Smite the ecumenical movement. Smite the deceivers. Smite the Irish Republican army. Bring to naught the plans of wicked men against us. And grant that the Lord may deliver his people and that this land may have upon it the signal blessing of Almighty God. We thank Thee that we can say from the depths of our heart, God is on the throne, and He doeth all things well. So be with us this night, for Christ's sake, and the people of God said, Amen. You may be seated. going to read the Word of God now, as we find it recorded for us in Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1. There's Bibles in front of you in the pure, in the pure make use of them. They're there for your use and edification. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, 
nor by letter as from us, as at the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. The great apostasy precedes the second coming of our Lord and Jesus, the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Falling away. From those Greek words we get the word apostasy. Apostasy. Falling away. A departure from the truth. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. He opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now let it will let until he be taken out of the way. Then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie. In the original a definite article, is there that they should believe the lie, that they all might be damned. Who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And God shall add his blessing to this reading from the infallible book. For his name's sake, amen. Let's bow our heads. I take the promised Holy Ghost, the blessed power of Pentecost. To fill me to the uttermost, I take. Thank God he undertakes for me. And the people of God said, Amen. There is no doubt about it that this is an age of deception. It is a great thing that we are not searching for authority today. It is a great thing that our authority is the inspired, inerring, infallible Word of God. And we don't need to turn to any preacher, to any parson or priest, to any church body, to any church council, to any important ecclesiastical figure. That we don't turn to hear the so-called infallible voice of a pope or an archbishop or anyone else. That we have the sure authority of God's holy word. I don't know what we would do in this hazy, crazy age when men are running here and there and all sorts of of religious deceptions are abroad. We hadn't the sure foundation, 
the sheet anchor of God's eternal truth. Let us turn to the second chapter of Second Thessalonians. And you will notice that in verse 10, it says, With all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. I don't know any better description of the whole Roman Catholic system than those words of Holy Scripture. The practices and principles of popery are with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. At this morning's service, a lady handed me a tip. She said it's by one of the Baptist preachers who didn't want any protest made when the Pope was going to come to Northern Ireland and wrote in that line, first of all in the Irish Independent Press and then in other newspapers. I was amazed when I listened to this tape. The preacher said that no Christian had any right to protest and that no preacher had any right to preach about the Pope. And he went on to say that he didn't know one scripture in the Bible that would countenance public protest. I don't know what Bible he reads, but I know this, that when you get a prominent evangelical Baptist preacher telling his congregation that no Christian has any right to protest, that no preacher should preach against the Pope, and that the Bible nowhere countenances public protest against error, then I believe that we are surely and most certainly in the last day. Let me just say this tonight. That preacher must never have read the Gospels. He must never have studied the life of the greatest preacher of all. Who was the greatest preacher of all? None other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Did the Lord Jesus Christ believe in public protest and public demonstration? Yes, sir. He went into the temple. He took a scourge, a cord. He prepared a lash. He tumbled over the tables of those that had polluted God's temple. He laid his whip upon their backs and he cleansed the temple of God publicly from defilement. And he didn't do it once. He did it twice in his ministry. If you know anything about the life of the Lord Jesus, you'll know he cleansed the temple at the commencement of his ministry. And he cleansed it again at the end of his ministry. So he commenced his ministry with a public protest and ended his ministry with a public protest. What about Paul? He was a good preacher, wasn't he? He wrote more of the New Testament than any other human writer under the agency of the Holy Spirit. He was the first man to organize a jail sit-in. Did you know that? A jail sit-in. You see, they put them into prison wrongfully. And then they wanted to slip them out in the morning and get them away. But he said, I'm not going. 
I'm sitting tight in this prison. And they said, what will we do? He said, the judges that put me in wrongfully will have to come from their magistrate's bench and walk all the way to the prison and come in and say, please, Paul, come out. He was a bit of a protester, wasn't he? I wonder what the Baptist pastor would do with Paul. I'm sure he wouldn't want a jailbird in his pulpit anyway. But Paul was one worse than a jailbird. He organized a sit-in in prison. I was so glad to get out. I didn't want to organize any sit-in. The whole of the Bible tells us, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And the Word in the original is publicly rebuke them. Publicly take them to task. No wonder certain sections of the Baptist church today are in an, a state of bewilderment, not knowing what popery is about and what our Protestant heritage is about. I had a young man with me, gloriously converted from the Roman Catholic Church, who is a member of the Baptist Church. And he says, I'm a meal. I have been saved from this system of Romanism. God has delivered me from the lies of Popery. And here I discover that the people I'm fellowshipping with don't realize the darkness and idolatry and priestcraft and superstition of this system. So we would do well to remind ourselves tonight that it is the duty of every believer. And it is the bounden duty of God's servant to stand in the evil day. Of course, many people don't want to stand because of the reproach that comes as a result of the stand. Last night, our building, as you know, was stoned. One of the plate glass windows was smashed. The authorities told me this morning that they would expect many more attacks on this building during the Pope's visit. And that probably this there would be a mountain campaign of such things. It wouldn't at all surprise me. But let us not think that that is anything. Because the Church of Rome, if it had its full power, wouldn't break windows, but would break the bones of the people of God as she did in the past. Don't think there's any change in the Roman Catholic Church. There's another matter that I want to mention this evening by way of preface. I welcome every voice that's raised against Romans. I welcome every voice that's raised against the Pope's visit. I welcome every voice that's raised against the machinations of Jesuitry. But I must say, I am greatly disappointed when those voices are not loud and clear and strong the way they ought to be. A group of Irish Presbyterian ministers and laymen who were first organized for complete withdrawal from the World Council of Churches and then changed to an organization of concerted witness to the Reformed faith within the Irish Presbyterian Church, had an advert in the newsletter yesterday. The advert was drawing attention to the statements of the Confession of Faith. But what amazed me that when they refer to chapter 25 of the Confession, they stopped their quotation before it came to the bite. And they put in, there is no other head of the church but the Lord Jesus Christ. Full stop. What's the rest of the confession? Nor can the Pope of Rome in any sense be head thereof, but is that Antichrist. That man of sin and son of perdition that exalted himself in the church 
against Christ and all that is called God. Surely that was a most appropriate thing to put in if they were protesting the Pope's visit. But of course with that, there is a reproach. And then I was greatly disturbed when Mr. Neely was questioned on downtown radio. And when it was said, you say it's a sin. And he said, well, that's maybe pitching it too high. Although you're coping our own document. He said, I would rather say it was sinful. Well, I think... If you take the proper meaning of sinful, it's really worse than sin, for it's full of sin. But I, I don't understand people. If you're not going to fight this battle, why start off drawing the sword? I have had Swiss television, Austrian television, German television, and Italian television, and of course, the most Catholic country of all. RTE television with me. And they all bring it up. Why do you say the Pope is the Antichrist? I said to a wee German reporter this week, did you ever hear of a German called Martin Luther? And she blinked. She blinked. She didn't even know the history of her own country. You would think that Ian Paisley was the first person that ever called the Pope the Antichrist. You'd think that I was the evil man, and in my evil mind, a hatred of Romanism coined this phrase. It's about time we knew what the teaching, the traditional teaching, the biblical teaching, the Christian teaching of the Protestant churches were. And I trust that we as a people will be well instructed in the faith and will know where we stand on these issues. Now, the Pope is coming to do two things. We're told tonight he's going to talk about the H block. Well, I want to say I don't want the Pope in Northern Ireland. But I really believe I have it's sad going to make some reference. He has been briefed. We read by the Cardinal. Let me say to you tonight, there are two things, and I'm coming now to the religious protest that we must make. There are two things that the Pope is going to do by his visit. He's not coming to Ulster, thank God. Hello, Bill Jeffrey has announced that the Pope has invited him to meet him in Drogheda. And he's going down, or is it Dundalk or Drogheda? Drogheda. He's going down to Drogheda. Maybe they'll allow Bill to carry the head of the blessed Oliver Plunkett. Maybe they'll give him that job. And he's going to invite the Pope in the name of the Ulster people with the soup, with the soup coupons that he got. He's going to bring them down and give them to the Pope and invite them to come to Northern Ireland. Who give Bill Jeffries the right to invite the Pope to come to the United Kingdom? He couldn't even gather up enough soap coupons to wash his face properly. And then he says he's going to invite the Pope. He's going down. Of course, that's the Alliance Party. But the Alliance Party is only an appendix of Popery anyway. That's all it is. But that may say, there are two things that are going to happen. The spending of 18 million, that's what the reckon it's going to cost to bring him here and take him away again. Three days visit. Six million a day. Pretty good money. You could get a good hotel for that, I'm sure. Now let me say this. There are two things going to happen. Number one, every place the Pope goes, there's going to be a Mass. And that Mass is going to be publicly demonstrated. 
across the Irish Republic, and no doubt across our television sets, for the BBC will be tripping over themselves to get it. Even our five o'clock news reports now is all about knock. It would really sicken you, wouldn't it? Think that we were part of the Republic. I don't want to knock, knock who's there. I do not indeed. want nothing to do with it. But anyway, there's going to be the Mass. And secondly, the main reason why the Pope is coming is to celebrate the centenary of the supposed apparition of Mary at Knock. So two things are going to happen. The central act of Roman worship, the Mass, is going to be given great prominence. Mary is going to be given great prominence. And running parallel with that, the Pope as the vicar of Christ. The word vicar means substitute for Christ. I have in my hand the little leaflet hand that I at all masses today in the Roman Catholic. I wasn't there. But, uh, it was handed out today. And uh, there's a prayer. Mary, mother of the church. Intercede for our Holy Father John Paul and for all the people of Ireland that his visit may bring us closer to your Son, our Lord Jesus. Amen. So they're all called to offer this prayer to Mary. And then it tells us here, with great joy, we welcome our Holy Father, Pope John Paul, as he, Christ vicar on earth, travels through our country, he speaks to us in Christ's name. He who hears you, hears me. Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 16. Rome is good at mistranslating and misinterpreting God's precious word. So we have these three things. Could I just say to you this evening, as firmly as I possibly can, that I totally and absolutely repudiate the claims that the Pope makes about his person. There is a vicar of Christ on earth. The vicar of Christ on earth, Christ's other self, is God the Holy Ghost. This is the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. If I go not away, the Comforter will not come. But if I go away, the Comforter will come. And the only vicar of Christ on earth is God the Holy Ghost. And anybody who claims to be God the Holy Ghost or the vicar of Christ on earth has committed the unpardonable sin. Let's get this straight. You read the word of God. Utter blasphemy for anybody to claim. So I could not have anything to do with a religious leader who claimed to be in the place of Christ and to do the work of God, the Holy Ghost. No. What do we find? We find that the ecumenical churches are going to meet them. The archbishops and bishops of the Church of Ireland, they say it's a purely social occasion. I don't know what sort of wine they're going to take or what sort of cocktails will be passed out, but they're going to make it a social occasion. He's going to meet them before the Mass, and I... I'm informed that they're all going to attend the Mass after he meets up with them. But the Methodists, because there happens to be a protest going on in the Methodist Church, and thank God here, there, and yonder, independent Methodist churches are springing up, so the Methodists have some trouble. So they decided that they would give the Pope a letter and they would 
be Protestants in that they would be showing to the people that they weren't accepting all that Papa did, that they were making their protest. In fact, one of them said, Paisley scared of the Pope, but we are not. We are going to make our protest face to face. Oh, but Papa said, you will do no such thing. I'm not coming to Ireland to receive papers from the Methodist Church. If you want to send me any communication, you will send it by post to the papal nuncio. And if he feels that I should look at it, I'll condescend to look at it. One would have thought the Methodists would have as much spunk in them to say that's not acceptable. But what did they say? Oh, yes, Papa, that's wonderful. We'll send the letter. And the Methodist president announced that the letter was already sent. The Presbyterians, the Irish Presbyterians, they have a little trouble in their hands because there's a free Presbyterian church. And they know that there's a place where those who are not going to go the ecumenical road can find worship and the gospel preached and Christian fellowship. Of course, the moderator of the Presbyterian Church, Dr. Craig, and I would be churlish tonight if I didn't say, I am glad, I thank God, that he has refused to meet the Pope. I'm sorry he hadn't been a bit more stronger, but at least he said, I'm not going. He's a wise man. He's left the country so that nobody will be able to pressurize him. I'm sure there have been a lot of pressures on him. So he went to Canada. Well, he's not a bug. And Jack Weir is left in the saddle. I think he's going to have a sort of an unruly donkey like Balaam and his ass. He's going to have trouble with it. And the Presbyterians don't know now what to do. Should we go... Because we're not allowed to give the Pope our paper. Or should we send it through the papal nuncio? And they don't know. They're going to announce this week what they're going to do. If Jack Weir has his way, they will be there. Paper or no paper. So we find the cellar. But the amazing thing is that in these documents, there was no mention of the two vital issues, the Mass and Mary Oliveray. They talked about periphery things like mixed marriage, things that have nothing to do with the real controversy between Bible Protestantism and the Roman Catholic Church. Ah, this matter concerning Knock, told in the radio, all about Knock. That a hundred years ago, St. John, St. Joseph, and Mary suddenly appeared at the gable wall of the old church or chapel at Knock. And they stayed there for over an hour and a half. They stayed there. And people stood in the rain and watched them. And while they got wet, these apparitions never got wet. And one woman grabbed the foot of Mary and she found there was nothing there. It's most interesting. Let me say something. There is no Pope that has done more to elevate the worship of Mary than Pope John Paul. The cult of Mary is stronger in the Roman Church than ever before. I read three Roman Catholic newspapers every week just to find out what Papa's really doing. And in the Catholic Herald of Friday, September the 14th, Pope's prayer at Loretta for his Irish mission. What is Loretta? Loretta is a secret shrine to Mary in Italy. It is more unique than Knock or any other sacred shrine to what the Roman Catholics call Our Lady. Because at Loretta, there is a little house 
made of bricks. And that little house Rome claims is the very house that Mary was born in, in Nazareth. And the very house that the Lord Jesus was brought up in. And after the fall of the temple, that little house was carried by angels who flew it right across the Mediterranean Sea. And they landed it first of all in Dalmatia. It stayed there for eight years. And then it didn't like that place. So it said to the angels, carry me a bit farther. So after a few other flicks, it eventually arrived at Loretta. Now that's not what I say. That's what the Roman Catholic Church says. And that's what this paper says. Not something written a hundred years ago or five hundred years ago. What does it say? The Pope prayed alone for ten minutes in the little brick house, which has been revered for nearly seven centuries as Mary's home in that. Popularly believed to have been transported by angels from the Holy Land after the fall of Jerusalem. So the little house took wings. And it flew. But you know the amazing thing about this little house? The red brick, or the brick that it's made of, are of the very same clay as a little clay pit down the road. Now isn't it strange that there was a, a little clay pit in Nazareth with the very same clay to make the very same bricks as was at their end. Isn't that an amazing thing? And when the Pope got down on his knees for ten minutes, this is what he prayed. There's a special litany. The litany called the Laurentian litany to be said in the little brick house. And he invoked the blessing of Mary upon his Irish visit. And he called her most holy Mary, most holy generator of God. I want you to think about these titles. Mother of divine grace, mirror of justice. You need that when he looks at the Mia's present. You need the mirror of justice, all right. Seat of wisdom, cause of our joy, mystical robe. Tower of David, Tower of Ivory, House of Gold, Ark of the Covenant, Gate of Heaven, Morning Star, Health of the Sick, Refuge of Sinners, Comfort of the Afflicted, Queen of Angels, Patriarchs, Prophets, Apostles, Martyrs, Confessors, Virgins, and of all saints. Queen conceived without sin. Queen of the Holy Rosary. And he implored Mary. Yes, Burl, you better get that in your team. That's too good to miss. Let me say this to you tonight. Let me say this to you tonight. He implored Mary to prosper his business. And at the shrine at night, the very same eulogy is going to be made to Mary. Now let me tell you, the Mary of the Roman Catholic Church has nothing whatsoever to do with Mary, the Virgin, who was the human instrument for the bringing of the Lord Jesus into this world. Where did this Mary, this mystic rose come from? That's the woman of Babylon. And in the Babylonian religion, there was always the mother and the child religion. You'll read about it even in the book of Jeremiah, where they were weeping for Thomas. That's why 
the pagans carried a wee chain with a T on it. Thomas and the Roman Catholic Church carry the same little T, but it's now called the cross. Don't you think that the Lord Jesus was crucified on a cross piece of wood? For he wasn't. He was crucified on a tree. The word in the book is a stake. And this idea of the cross that has filtered its way into our worship, even into Protestantism, is a symbol of Babylonianism. Nothing to do with the Christian life. And of course the cross in Scripture has to do with the work of the cross. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross. That's the work of the cross, not the wood of the cross anyway. It's the work that was done on the cross that saves me, not the wood of the cross. Tamar. And this has been carried out of Babylonianism into Catholicism. Christian names have been put on it, but it's the old symbol of Babylon. And that now they're going to worship and bow down to the Virgin. And it starts at the England. Here's another Roman Catholic. Paper. I do read the Mingle. I don't read the Belfast Telegraph, but I read these people. The universe. Thousands at Walsingham. Walsingham is the national shrine of Our Lady. And just a few days ago, they carried the statue of Mary through the streets of that town. And they worship before it. And you know where they had the meeting to start it off? In the Church of England Church. The rector gave his church over to them and took part in the service as they commenced their worship of the Virgin. Soon they will have in the streets of England the things that happened in pre-Reformation time. And if you lift your voice and cry idolatry, it will be imprisonment. And eventually, God knows it will be death. We're going back to the persecuting time. And of course, if you say anything about it, you're a bigot. You're a madman. See, the uh, peace spokesman today said that there were too many Paisleyites and bigots in all the churches. So we're all bigots. That's what they said about Luther. He was a bigot. He was a madman. He should be locked up in the asylum. And many times you've heard that about this preacher. And you'll hear about it more and more. He should be locked up. He shouldn't be allowed to say these things. Glory to God, we'll be saying. We'll be saying. Now what about this? Did, did something happen at night? You know the strange thing? That when this happened at night, there were other apparitions happened in Cork. And these things were being seen in Cork. And everybody was going to Cork. And the pubs were doing great business in Cork. And the hotels were... And you know what they discovered? Fact of history. They discovered that the leading publican had purchased a magic lantern. And had concealed it in the wind. And he had got a son to operate it with slides of statues of Mary. And the people thought that the Blessed Virgin was visiting the place every night. And of course the pubs were doing a great business. But it was all exposed. All came out in the wash. There's a book. If you want to get a book about popery in Ireland, get this book, Priests and People in Ireland by Michael J. F. McCarthy. And when you read that book, you'll understand the lying of Rome and the deceivings of Rome and the deceits of Rome. And you'll get it in the Belfast Library. Go and queue up for it. And they'll wonder why everybody wants to read that book. Tell them Paisley recommended it. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll get a cut there for the, from the line. And there's a whole chapter of not in this book. I'm going to print some of it in the next issue of our paper so that you'll have it. And the strange thing, the priest who was a knock at that time, he wouldn't, couldn't be found. 
He never was available from the operations of peace. And when he was told about them, he wouldn't even go out to examine. Was he operating a magic lantern at that time? Well, I'll tell you what he did operate. Operate. He operated a, a, a racket in plaster from the wall. The Daily Telegraph said that Archdeacon Kavanaugh was his name. Said some little while ago, I received a sick call late at night to a man who was said to be vomiting blood and in extreme danger. After ministering to him, I called for a glass of water, sprinkled on it a few particles of the mortar from the gable walls of the chapel and bade him drink. He did so. And at once he began to recover and became perfectly well. Plaster from the gable wall. And he goes on, oh, he goes on, to tell us that the daughter of our Welsh of Clifton regained sight after bathing her eyes in water containing a piece of plaster from the chapel wall. Oh, and helping of Drogheda, troubled with deafness, placed a bit of mortar in his ears, and suddenly he heard. These are the facts of the situation. Of course, the archbishops of the Church of Ireland, and the Presbyterian apostates, and Methodist false prophets, will not be crying aloud against Popery. Of course, the law. Deceptions of Roman Catholicism. And I have here a copy of a letter written by a parish priest by the name of C.W. Corbett. This letter appeared on Wednesday, the 27th of July, 1938, in the Irish Times. And this is what he said. He said, When the apparition Came, there was little talk at the time. It was only years and years afterwards when the witnesses that were supposed to have seen these apparitions had died. Then Rome started to tell her story and get into the business, the money-making business of now. But let me tell you what he said. He said, we heard very little more of the matter. And by the time of my ordination in 1881... The whole subject was almost entirely forgotten. Some t t years after, in about 1886, I was speaking to a naval parish priest who's long since dead, and the subject cropped up. I asked him what he thought about it, and he quietly told me that he visited Knock and made a private inquiry for himself. He came to the conclusion that the whole matter originated in that one of the witnesses used to indulge in strong drink. And when he was taken with drink, he saw visions. Saw visions. As many in that state have done and will do. That's not a fundamentalist Protestant preacher said that. That's a Roman Catholic priest. Now this man didn't leave the church. But he was opposed. You keep quiet, friend, or you'll get no cornflakes. Now let me say this to you. Let me say this to you tonight. He did not leave the Roman Catholic Church, this priest. This priest was against what he called deceit. He said, we have had an exposure in West Cork of apparitions. And the church has found out to be deceiving the people. We have had the whole case of the temple more miracles, which were also exposed as fakes. And he says, we as a church must not have any more of these fakes, for they're going to do our church harm. There is a Roman Catholic church, a priest living at the time, who brings his own evidence to the subject. And yet the whole of our land are going to wonder after the beast. That's what the Bible says. The wonder 
after these. How people can be deceived, and they will deceive. They would accept anything but the precious truth of God's holy word. And what about the Mass? The Lord Jesus Christ died once and for all upon the cross of shame for sinners. His hands will never be nailed again to the cross. His blessed brow will never be pierced again with thorns. His feet shall never run blood, being nailed to the tree, nor shall his side be opened again for the flowing of blood and water. My Savior offered one sacrifice for sins forever. This man... Having offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. The job of redemption, the act of atonement, the great propitiatory work is done forevermore. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. And you will see thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of people when he holds up the wafer and cries, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Then they shall fall prostrate in worship, and the whole of that vast assembly shall take part in the greatest insult that ever could be made to the person and finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is for those reasons that we repudiate the Pope's claims and reject his visit and protest against this brazen effrontery and idolatry of the person of the Son of God. Oh, that Protestantism might return to God's Word. Oh, that God, when this empty Christ arrives, might reveal to men and women the true Christ through the preaching of the Gospel. Oh, that our eyes might be turned away from the deceits of Rome eyes might be turned to the truth of that holy word that maketh wise unto salvation. It is an evil day. What shall we do? Every Christian should redouble his efforts in getting out the gospel of Jesus Christ. We should protest against the idolatry with all means in our power. We should spread the gospel, the true gospel of Jesus Christ. We should give of our means for the spreading of that gospel. And we should never rest until God sends a great revival to this land of Ulster, to this island home of ours, and that we'll see those in darkness brought into the glorious light of the gospel. There is one thing that Rome fears, and it's this book. And there's one thing that terrorizes Rome, and it's a preacher of God's Word. God send us a race of fearless, spirit-filled preachers who shall fill this land with the doctrine of the gospel that Jesus alone saved, that Mary has no part in man's salvation. And that there is only one Holy Father, and that is God the Father, and He alone deserves that title. And there is only one Vicar of Christ, and that's God the Holy Ghost. And there's only one Mediator, and that's Jesus Christ Himself. If there be someone here tonight, and you as yet, though cradled in Protestantism, have never come to Jesus Christ and received Him as your suit, I trust tonight, in the silence of your heart, you will call upon the name of the Lord, and the Lord will save you.
For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. After this service, the session room of the church will be opened as usual as an invited. I trust, dear sinner friend, dear backslider, you'll make your way to that room. And I trust tonight you'll come and receive the Son of God and be born again of His Spirit. I have to go tonight and preach in Not Medulla. I would appreciate your prayers. It will be my fifth message today. May it be the best message of all. And best of all, may sinners be seen through the preaching of His Holy Word. Let's stand to our feet to be dismissed. O God, our Father, we thank Thee for Thy holy and precious Word. We thank Thee for the truth of the Bible. We thank Thee that we don't need man-made priests, that we have the great High Priest, and we depend upon the finished work of Christ. Bless this people, those without Christ. Bring them to the blessed Son of God. Separate us now with thy blessing. And as we go to that Madonna, may thy hand be upon us for good. And may our ministry be owned and blessed of God in the salvation of the lost. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen and amen. This Reformation audio track is a production of Stillwater's Revival Books. SWRB makes thousands of classic Reformation resources available, free and for sale, in audio, video, and printed formats. Our many free resources, as well as our complete mail-order catalog, containing thousands of classic and contemporary Puritan and Reform books, tapes, and videos at great discounts, is on the web at www.swrb.com. We can also be reached by email at swrb at swrb.com, by phone at 780-450-450, 3730, by fax at 780-468-1096, or by mail at 4710-37A Avenue, Edmonton, that's E-D-M-O-N-T-O-N, Alberta, abbreviated capital A, capital B, Canada, T6L3T5. You may also request a free printed catalog. And remember that John Calvin, in defending the Reformation's regulative principle of worship, or what is sometimes called the scriptural law of worship, commenting on the words of God, which I commanded them not, neither came into my heart, from his commentary on Jeremiah 7.31, writes, God here cuts off from men every occasion for making evasions, since he condemns by this one phrase, I have not commanded them, whatever the Jews devised. There is then no other argument needed to condemn superstitions than that they are not commanded by God. For when men allow themselves to worship God according to their own fancies, and attend not to his commands, they pervert true religion. And if this principle was adopted by the Papists, all those fictitious modes of worship in which they absurdly exercise themselves would fall to the ground. It is indeed a horrible thing for the Papists to seek to discharge their duties towards God by performing their own superstitions. There is an immense number of them, as it is well known, and as it manifestly appears. Were they to admit this principle, that we cannot rightly worship God except by obeying his word, they would be delivered from their deep abyss of error. The prophet's words, then, are very important. When he says that God had commanded no such thing, and that it never came to his mind, as though he had said that men assume too much wisdom when they devise what he never required, nay, what he never knew.